Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever Landscape Livestream. A series of events where we're going to be taking a shallow dive into everything related to laneway housing. Spend our lunch hour trying to speak to leaders and learn more about not just laneway housing but other housing typologies in Toronto. As is evidenced by our topic for today. Uh, I'm your host Craig Race, one of the co-founders of Landscape. And we decided to kick off our first ever laneway housing specific lunch hour talk uh, with something that has nothing to do with laneway housing at all, garden suites. Seems appropriate. Uh, I'll be joined by my fellow co-founders, Alex Sharp and Andrew Sorbera. Uh, the three of us are the founders of Lanescape, and we've been working on advocating for housing policy for many years together, and more recently actually implementing it on the laneways of Toronto. We want to see what that's going to look like in new frontiers of housing typologies in Toronto, uh, especially for garden suites. Before we get into that, I uh, just want to mention we will be doing this on a regular basis. On next Thursday, I'll be joined by Lanescape Senior Manager Tony Kuna. He'll be talking with me about the actual nuts and bolts of designing and building laneway houses in Toronto and what it actually is going to look like if you decide you want to do this for yourself. We also have future guests uh, that include fellow architects and journalists to talk about sustainability, uh, the, so the societal effects of housing on laneways, and everything you might want to learn about laneway housing in general. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe to all of our social media channels and our newsletter so you can see upcoming live streams as well as our workshops. Uh, but more recently, we've moved those online and made them free. So anyone in Toronto can tune in to see what it actually takes to build a laneway house on your property and learn all you need to know about designing and building. So to start off, I'm going to invite in uh, my fellow co-founder, Alex Sharp. Uh, he is going to talk with me about what we've learned about laneway housing so far. Alex, how are you? Hey, Craig, how are you? I'm great. I see you have your landscape hat on. Yes, sir. Hot off the press. Good branding. Until we can get haircuts again, <laughs> these were a genius purchase. <laughs> there we go. Fully equipped. <clears throat> so are you tuning in to us from your laneway house, Alex? Yeah. Um, I am in the last few weeks here, hopefully, of uh, living in the laneway suite. Um, and it's been great. It's been a little bit unique given COVID and trying to operate from from a, a nice uh, sort of suite, but with two family members working and two children at home full time. It's been a bit of a battle, but a uh, great environment to, to work. And um, I'm kind of looking out the window, looking north up my laneway. And right now there's no other suites here, but hopefully uh, that'll change soon. It's been interesting as people have been staying in the neighborhoods, the laneways have become a bit of a place for families to socially distance and talk over the fence to each other. I guess that's the closest thing we have to interaction these days, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, it actually has been great. I've gotten to know some of my neighbors much better through this period as a result of that and garage doors up and sort of six, eight feet back off the laneway, but you can still kind of conduct a normal conversation and it's been a welcome reprieve from isolation. <laughs> yeah, great. So tell us a little bit more about your house. You were one of the early developers of laneway housing uh, long before the policy was ever in existence <laughs> to do it as of right. I understand you were able to do it because you had a fantastic architect. Uh, but tell me a bit about the process you went through and how you've used that as a template for our company. Yeah, I mean, if we want to get technical, my architect was just a designer at the time, but uh... Going back to when we first started talking about this, obviously we were living as roommates in a condominium downtown and always sort of touched on how Vancouver was really doing something unique and interesting. And I hadn't grown up in the city and I know you hadn't either. So we saw an opportunity that was right under our noses. Um, and in 2011, I came across this property on Jones Avenue. It was a triplex with an illegally converted single story garage. And obviously, uh, found, you know, saw the opportunity right away, <clears throat> uh, found a great architect who was also across the hall from me in my condominium and we started conceptualizing and obviously we had a lot of great attributes with the site that we were able to leverage and work with, but I was certainly naive about <laughs> the fact that even though this was here and it had been here for decades, uh, the city was not going to be as enthusiastic as I was about the potential of it. 
Um, so obviously it was, it was, a it was an immediate letter, um, from the city planning department when we went in front of the committee of adjustment, essentially saying, we don't, we don't support houses behind houses. This is bad planning policy. And as a young developer, that was very frightening because, uh, you know, everybody who was a stakeholder and a, and a consultant to me was saying, this is very risky. You shouldn't really do this. You're likely to fail. Um, and when you're young and you're idealistic and you're hearing that, thankfully, I was I was ignorant enough to not listen uh, and just plow ahead. And we've ended up with, like I said, a beautiful sort of living environment. Um, I lived here with my wife before we got married. We got married here. We had our first kid here. We had our second kid here. It got a little bit tight as a two bedroom home, but uh, we're making it work amazingly well through all of this and thankfully we've had it as the uh you know the example with which we can show people that don't be afraid of what you don't know it, it it's a logical way to add value and intensify <clears throat> really great neighborhoods throughout the city and this demonstrated that it can work and we were uh, really lucky to benefit from the model that vancouver had developed uh long before anything in toronto was really happening uh specifically the fact that you agreed to make your laneway house non-severable and pull all the services from the main house. Um, that obviously gave you a big leg up with uh, your house before the changing lanes policy existed. And it ended up becoming sort of the critical aspect of getting a new policy enacted for as of right development, right? A hundred percent. I remember obviously we did a bunch of research and work leading up to our committee of adjustment hearing, trying to find precedent and examples and really getting to the root of it, we were trying to understand what this, what the opposition was like recognizing some people just don't like change. There are technical, um, and, and sort of safety issues that need to be addressed and considered, uh, the technical part, more the planning policy and the idea of, you know, the severability and the risk of essentially over densifying small lots, but also from a safety perspective, just how do you make sure that people are able to get access to services that are required in those emergency situations? Um, and so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the disclosures around the problems were out there in front of everybody already. There'd been reports done by the city saying, well, this is the problem. And so we kind of just thought, well, let's come forward with some logical, straightforward potential solutions to these problems and then, uh, go from there. And ultimately, as, as you know, we, we, we really tried to go out of our way to crowdsource as much perspective on the topics as we could. And provide a variety of forums with which you could weigh in and lend your perspective. Uh, and that, that ultimately led to the report um, that was crafted with the help of Evergreen. Uh, and then, you know, frankly, um, I think ultimately the city ran a very comprehensive and thorough process following that initial report. But I think the quality of that initial report is indicative of the fact that like the policy ultimately took a lot of the same sort of principles that were outlined in that report um, and, and put them forward into an actual policy that is now as of right. And that's fabulous for the city. It's fabulous for, for guys like you and I, who are ultimately passionate about seeing more of these properties developed and, and seeing more utilization of our great laneway network. Yeah, you touched on an interesting point there, the emergency access. That was something that I think we contemplated when the policy was being created. Um, but it's been really interesting to see how that's actually been codified and implemented by the city. Um, and I think that's something that's kind of a good segue into what's going to carry forward into garden suites. Um, I mean, in your house, we had really good emergency access just naturally on the site. Uh, but it's something that is the, kind of the biggest concern when it comes to building laneway houses on a lot of lots in the city. Absolutely. And what's interesting is uh, I'm no expert on it, but it's not a zoning <laughs> issue. So. Yeah. Um, you, you sort of have a variety of stakeholder groups that are part and parcel to enacting policy of this nature in the city. And on top of it, you have the provincial policy, which is essentially meant to shape and guide the, the, the municipal direction and policy that's taken. But oftentimes these things are not correlated well uh, and, and coordinated. So I think there's been a lot of uh, confusion on the part of various uh you know homeowners and participants in the process as these rules have sort of gone from a theory into practical application um i know the city is working hard to hear real life examples and real world circumstances and adapt and, and shift and evolve the policy which is the right approach um and you know it, whatever you do you have to be thoughtful again going back to the safety component um that's the critical piece 
but I think there are practical solutions to get around a lot of these current issues. And I know there's a case on, I think it was Manning, where there was, a, you know, there was some precedent established with respect to the Building Code Commission um, and some, you know, potential applications on ways around some of these issues. But the city kind of needs to continue to evolve the policy, as I said, and create more clarity on that particular topic and hopefully expand the opportunity um, to create, you know, more sites that qualify as of right. <clears throat> yeah, it's been interesting. The The city was making headway on sort of loosening their emergency access requirements, especially uh, on the coattails of that building code commission decision on Manning Avenue. Uh, and then sort of COVID hit and sidelined everything related to that. Um, I've been talking to the councilor about the state of it. Do you know anything about it? <laughs> the, no. appar apparently, it's going in front of the the um, housing committee at some point in the near future. So we might actually see that get loosened up soon. Um, yeah, and that's what needs to happen, right? Because I think at the end of the day, it's somewhat ambiguous. You have people that are saying, you know, they're, 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 I don't think anybody has the exact answer in in every situation. So the more the policy can sort of work to create that clarity and and uh, and establish certainty on, on what you can and can't do and and um, it, you know which sites are ultimately going to be applicable, that's going to I think uh, reducing the uncertainty is is critical throughout not only laneway suites but as we look to garden suites as we look to essentially a modernization of our whole zoning framework in the city, which is is far overdue. I, I couldn't agree more. So you sort of bring the the developer perspective uh, to our group. Um, how have you been finding, like from you and your fellow developers, laneway housing has affected ownership of small scale residential property and investment in properties like those? It's an evolution, as you know, Mr. Race. We are uh, we're pushing all fronts to try to expand um, you know the opportunities and and i think we've been we're really fortunate to have the support of some key counselor partners anna and mary margaret early on and and i think brad's done a good job of picking up where mary margaret's left off with respect to the policy side one of the biggest constraints of this being um something that like developers go after is just scale uh you know a lot of my developer friends are like what are you doing with this this is really small and it's how are you how are you ever going to make anything out of this and i think the reality is i say to them it's not necessarily a profit motive here. It's more of a passion project. I do think that it's the right approach for the city to be taking. I think there is opportunity. And for us, like as we look to try to establish more of these, both from a service pro provider standpoint and, and potentially as an investor, capital is the, is the constraint. Um, the CMHC has a lot of great programs for financing if it's five units or up. Most of these are under that threshold. So you are in a situation where you're kind of borrowing against your income um, and the rules around financing rental properties are, uh, you know, they, it's ripe for uh, innovation. So I think there's a lot of conversations I'm having with friends and, and industry stakeholders around, let's get more innovative for this product typology because it's highly creative. Uh, it's fabulous end user space and you know there's no question I, I think from anybody who lives and and sort of understands the city of toronto there's no question that we don't have enough housing um and we need more of it and that's gonna that's gonna benefit i think far more people than it's gonna hurt and that's the fear uh, around new policy and change so hopefully uh with additional res resources on the financing side more developers will have the opportunity to start looking at this and and um, employing laneway suites as another sort of tool to, uh, you know, create investment opportunities. And also, if you're thinking about it from the standpoint of the debt providers, I mean, this is a real opportunity for them to make a significant return with a relatively low risk proposition. So it's just about getting everybody aligned and, under and, and expanding the understanding and awareness. And we're, we're working hard on that. Well, what I found interesting is that since we've started designing and building these, uh, the majority of our clients are homeowners. So sure, there are developers looking at this, but to your point, it doesn't scale the way a mid-rise or a high-rise building does. 
So it's really put that in, that insertion of new housing units into communities like ours in the hands of the people who already live there. That was something that we theorized would happen when the policy was being created. And now we're really seeing the rubber hit the road on that. So now that it's almost like individual homeowners are becoming their own developers, um, you make a good point about debt mechanisms and uh, ways to actually finance the construction of these things need to become more accessible to homeowners rather than just something only institutions can access because they're not really as active in the space as people like everyone on this chat are. Yeah, and I think another component of the education piece is a lot of people are scared of debt. That's just the reality. A lot of people that I know and grew up with and that they were raised on the principle that debt is bad. And many times debt is bad. You don't want to carry you know, high interest credit card debt. You don't want to, um, you know, you, you, there are certain forms of debt that are detrimental. <laughs> and then there's other forms of debt that are beneficial. And so when we go to homeowners and we say, look, you're going to spend four, four fifty, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, potentially, depending on your finished selection in the site on a suite, but you don't have to put any money down. Potentially, we can get it to you all in the form of a mortgage and a mortgage. I don't want a mortgage. I, I just paid off my mortgage. Um, and so it takes a bit of education in the context of, well, by taking on this mortgage, you're creating equity value in your property and you're generating cash flow because the amount of rent you can collect is much more than the serviceability of that debt. Uh, so it's, it's just, and some people are still not going to be comfortable with debt. Ultimately, yeah. I recognize like I have a different risk tolerance than many, but at least I, I, I want to give people the benefit of understanding the opportunity and then let them make their decisions accordingly. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, because that's certainly a barrier to entry. It's just when it comes to building these things in neighborhoods, they're starting to pop up like crazy, but we're still relying on people who are not experienced developers or landlords or all these things to go and implement them. So as we look into new alternative forms of housing, like garden suites, how we're going to see those numbers impact our new housing. Because obviously it's pretty easy to put a basement apartment into your house right now. Um, but there's a lot of privacy and co-living issues with that. Now that we've moved tenants back to the laneway, it's become a little more attractive, but also has a higher barrier to entry. So if we just create garden suite policy, will that continue to expand the people who are willing and able to access um, this type of policy to create rental housing in our neighborhoods? And how's that going to see our housing grow where families really need it? It's going to be fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think at the end of the day, there are tons of opportunities, you know, beyond the laneways and garden suites are the logical next step. I think there's uh, there is a degree of consideration that needs to be taken with respect to the privacy concerns and, um, you know, ma maintaining, again, the character of the neighborhoods. But if again, if you go through many neighborhoods where there are not a lot of uh, of laneways, there are a lot of coach houses. There's a lot of large detached garages that in many cases have a loft or a second floor component. I know in your private practice, Craig, you've done a bunch of infill residential um, whereby there is ancillary, there, ancillary structures um, that are big, you know, former stables. And there's all kinds of precedent from the past whereby Without a laneway, there's a big structure in the backyard and it's still a great neighborhood. It's still a wonderful place to live and to raise a family. Um, and one of the biggest frustrations, you know, as, as a developer, architect, stakeholder to development is just the NIMBY movement, the push against change in places like neighborhoods where people feel they have an entitlement to the way things are. Um, that That's a frustrating reality. and. It's something the city planners have to deal with and and the politicians and um, it's not an easy, easy thing to solve for. But again, it comes back to education and sort of highlighting many cases whereby there are coach houses that are wonderful. I think of the Anguses back in in Rosedale. Um, there, there's tons of examples where there's just a, a great uh, a great middle ground between maintaining privacy, scale and character, but <clears throat> intensifying these these neighborhoods beyond just laneways. Mm -hmm. We're getting uh, some good questions from uh, Trevor Bond in the chat here, who's a, a friend of Lanescape, um, asking about, you know, once I have a laneway house on my property and I have to move or sell my house, like what happens to me? Shed some light on that for us. Uh, sorry, what's the question? Like if once you have the laneway suite and you want to move, 
Yeah, you have to sell your property. What happens? Are you getting a premium? Is it easy to sell or is it a burden? I like how Trevor, the real estate agent, is asking that question. I probably ask him. I mean, I don't think there's that many examples of properties that have had a, a suite created under the new framework that have gone to market. I mean, Trevor, again, would probably know more than I by doing a comp search. But the reality is seen any. It's, it's like a uh, it's going to be a combination of an income approach, a replacement cost approach um, and then a utility. Somebody might just come in and fall in love with that site, with that layout, that suite, those finishes. And they got to have it. And the benefit is now you've got in a situation. I've got a few friends that were obviously working with the landscape to develop on. One guy is a, um, you know, he's an equity analyst. He makes a lot of money. He lives downtown in a condo. He bought a rental property. And now the bylaws came into effect. And he's looking at creating a laneway suite for him to move into as a primary residence, keep the, 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 rent, the front unit rented out. Um, and he's kind of, you know, he's, he's looking at this as a lifestyle choice for himself. When he goes to sell, the, the new person that buys that might be an investor who just wants four units instead of the triplex at the front. They've got now a fourth unit that's going to rent for a great premium because it's going to be a beautiful spot. Uh, it might be a user who comes in and says, I want to be just like that guy and live in the back, keep renting out the front. I mean, there's a variety of ways. The one thing you can't do, as many people ask about, is I just want to sell the laneway suite. And that goes back to the non-severability. It's, it's a condition of the of the entitlement that, um, you know, the city's adamant about maintaining the size of the lots, the composition and the scale of these, these properties in the neighborhood zones. Um, and it's a principle that makes a lot of sense to me, as you know, and you alluded to earlier, I didn't sever mine. Um, and I don't plan to, and when I, I don't want to sell this ever, I hope I never have to, but if I did sell it, it would be sold on the basis of income generation potential and future value of that coupled with, how much would it cost to build this all over again if I could get this site from scratch? So there's a few ways well, to look at valuation. Indeed. And I mean, uh, you, you're familiar with my last house that I put a basement apartment into and then sold. And uh, certainly having that income generating unit integral to the house made it very attractive. It might have reduced the number of people buying a little bit, but it also increased the value to a degree where it really got a lot of uh, interest in the listing. And I can only imagine that if that rental unit is detached, so the main house is still preserved as what a homeowner would want it to be, but then they also have the auxiliary suite at the back where it's out of sight, out of mind, it can only have positive value and surely it will sell at a premium and rapidly. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about it is you're, even if you're not planning to sell it, um, you're now creating an income stream that in many ways is inflation adjusted because you're allowed to you know, within the parameters of the um, the provincial policy, you're allowed to increase your rents. And obviously your costs go up over time as a landlord as well. Taxes go up, utilities go up, everything goes up. But the principle is, you know, you now have essentially an income generating unit, as you alluded to, that's away from your primary residence. Um, and that's going to create value that is near term. As soon as it's finished, usually there is an accretion in terms of the value relative to the cost. But going into into time, um, the value is going to go up because the income potential goes up as rents go up. So Yeah, I'm seeing good comments too about how any kind of accessory unit, but especially a detached one, really improves housing flexibility, which is so critical 100%. for multi-generational housing. Like it really opens up opportunities for not just renters, but loved ones to live in your space as well. Yeah, we heard a lot of that during our consultations, obviously, right? People that were coming forward saying, I either have a an elderly parent that I don't want to have to have move out of the property or <laughs> vice versa, you know, um, somebody has a young family that they want to move into their backyard and just kind of keep everybody close, close knit. And um, this is a great option if you're in that circumstance. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for catching us up on the state of laneway housing and uh, how we can start to look ahead to garden suites, Alex. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Craig. As always, good chatting. See you in the office at some point in the future, whenever we have an office again. <laughs> yeah. See you at our next virtual Zoom dart game. <laughs> Bye, Alex. Now we're going to bring in Andrew uh, Sorbara next, our other Landscape co-founder, to start to talk about what the future is going to look like, uh, potentially. Just waiting for Andrew to connect here. Hey, Andrew, how are you doing? Yeah. Doing okay. How are you, Craig? 
Good. Great hat. I can't see the haircut you haven't gotten just like the rest of us. <laughs> Unless you know a guy. Do you know someone that can uh, give me an underground haircut? Yeah. The guy who cuts my hair is actually going and cutting people's hair in outside spaces. So he'll, be, he'll meet you somewhere kind of with some public outdoor space and cut your hair out there. I was joking that uh, barbershop speakeasies are going to become the new prohibition thing. I think so. <laughs> but all that aside, let's focus on more important things. Um, so we just heard a lot from Alex about, you know, what we learned implementing the policy for laneway suites and uh, actually building them now. So let's talk a little bit about a policy for garden suites and what that could yeah. look like, what the process could look like, and possibly what a garden suite itself could look like in the future. Um, so can you start by just telling us what what is the state of garden suites in Toronto? If I want to build one, what do I have to do? Essentially, garden suites are kind of, they exist in this policy limbo, similar to laneway suites before we worked at the city on implementing some policy there. So there's really no certainty about what you can or can't do. There's no certainty about timing. There's no certainty about what fees will be levied on you. So they're subject to a lot of interpretation at the building and planning departments at city hall. So. Um, yeah, they really kind of, they're not officially permitted, um, but if you want to, if you do want to build one, you can go and design one and look for an approval the same way you would uh, for a late suite before the policy was implemented. Well, it's been ironic. Uh, a lot of the planners I work with have been saying that it's actually harder to get approval for a garden suite or a coach house now since the laneway suite policy was implemented, which is definitely a negative unintended consequence. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really lighting a fire to say we need to come up with a policy for this that's going to give an opportunity for people to build these in a sensitive and sensible way. Well, it's it, absolutely. And I think that one of the main points that, that I should mention is that, um, and this is picking up on a point that you and Alex just made um, about giving, um, giving the opportunity to homeowners that already live in neighborhoods, the opportunity to kind of expand their building footprint and, and add additional suites. Um, and because of that, because we're not work, because we're working with homeowners and not um, quote unquote developers, we need to create policy that is simple, straightforward, easy to understand, and affordable. Um, and that's what we did with layaway housing policy. And I think that for garden suites, we really need to go and, and do the same thing. Yeah, and it's, it, I mean, as you and I know. Uh, this is probably going to fit into sort of a broader housing policy reform that the city's trying to undertake. Uh, shout out to our cheerleader, cheerleaders and council, especially Anna Blau and Brad Bradford that really helped us with the layway suite policy. They're starting to contemplate garden suites, but part of a broader scheme. Like, what does that mean for garden suites and how's that going to help us homeowners actually get access to something? Yeah, so garden suites are, are being looked at in the context of unlocking a lot of latent density that exists in our single family neighborhoods across the city, uh, which is good because it means that the city is looking at a variety of different policy tools to unlock that density. But it also means that um, garden suite policy will not be considered on its own and therefore it may take longer because it's part of this broader package of policies that the city has been looking at. And most of this is now kind of unofficially been put on hold because of the COVID crisis. Um, we know that when the city does want to create policy, um, particularly when it's policy um, like the missing middle policy, which could potentially be controversial because it's dealing with um, what had previously been untouchable neighborhoods. Uh, we do need to have a lot of consultation, which involves people getting together and kind of large meeting situations and none of that's possible right now. Um, so it, it's kind of unofficially been put on hold, but that doesn't mean that the momentum is being lost. And I think that it's up to us as citizens who want to see the policy change to come up with uh, new mechanisms to build consensus. Um, they're out there, like clearly there's a lot of us working from home and we have started to uh, really get used to, to using a lot of the online resources that we have available to us now. So I think it would be, I think it's important for us to not lose the momentum and to look at the tools that we have in order to build uh, a virtual consensus, uh, consensus online. Because I think people, I think the people that we've been speaking to, even at Landscape, we get requests um, from homeowners that want to build a garden suite or want to build um, a detached secondary suite that doesn't necessarily fit into the laneway housing um, policy because it's not on a laneway. So 
Um, I think as we see more layaway houses being built, we're going to see a lot of homeowners that don't have lanes want something similar. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, as you know, earlier this year, we really wanted to start ramping up advocacy efforts for garden suites, uh, including engaging our fellow Torontonians, just like we did for laneway housing. Mm. Um, and that kind of hit a wall when the COVID pandemic occurred. Uh, and now we're sort of, we're seeing the city hall is focused on other far more important things. Mm. Um, so as citizens, we need to come up with ways to start advocating for this and almost creating the policy for city hall. Uh, because right now they're busy with other stuff, uh, but we need it to make sure we can c continue to live in our neighborhoods. So oh, do, you, do you have a vision for what our advocacy could look like in the age of COVID? I, you know what, I've had, I've had a kind of a few different thoughts. I think that um, when we look at what we did um, at Lanescape in order to kind of galvanize public opinion and bring people together and start to think about um, what we should and shouldn't build on laneways and what kinds of issues were really important and how they could be addressed. I think we were able to do that um, really effectively because we we came up with really creative forms of engagement and we um, we were working with willing partners at City Hall um, to allow us to kind of move forward and build this public consensus um, in a new and interesting creative way which got things done a lot more quickly. Um, I don't I don't know how effective uh, building consensus online virtually would be. Um, we do have to think carefully about the kinds of tools that we have available, um, but sh things like sharing information and communicating, um, they're easy to do online. So I don't know that it necessarily would kind of replace a public consultation process that would have to occur at some point in the future, but it could get things started so that people are aware of what's happening, people are starting to contribute to, to whatever policy uh, directions that they'd like to see in their neighborhoods. So it's, um, we can definitely get the ball rolling, um, even without getting together kind of in large groups the way that we typically do for consultation purposes. Yeah, I'm sort of uh, like sadistically excited for it. I mean, one of the tools we use when we were advocating for the laneway policy was an online survey. And that was really powerful in both getting feedback from people, but also just giving like a central touch point for everyone to gather and then stay informed about progress. I think we should launch one for garden suites. I, hey, I do too, I do too. I think that, um, I think that, I also think that, you know, that online survey, for example, reached thousands and thousands of people. When you have like in-person consultation sessions, you never get that kind of turnout. So I think working online um, will attract a lot more people who may have an interest, but may not necessarily be the type of person that would want to spend an evening in a school gym um, talking about garden suites. So it, there's there's a lot of potential there. And I think that we have to think carefully about kind, kinds of tools that we, we should uh, we should roll out um, in the next little while. Um, but I think there's definitely an opportunity to really get some some good momentum uh, going and getting people contributing. Yeah, well, uh, we obviously don't want to give anything away, but these kinds of things are in the work in our office. So we hope everyone stays tuned so yeah. they can uh, help have their say. We wish things were farther along in City Hall so we could have launched them for this, but uh, such is the world we live in, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what a garden suite would actually look like, because I think that's kind of at the forefront. I mean, obviously everyone wants to do their part to create a good policy and advocate for it, but it's nice to know what you get to the other side. And I know part of our approach to uh, coming up with a policy like this is by making a point of being kind of the dumbest person in the room, as I like to say, and almost approach our fellow Torontonians with the problem, not a solution, so we can figure out what the sensitivities are and then let the ultimate design almost reveal itself to us all. But I mean, you've seen what's been happening with laneway suites, uh, what's working, what's not there, how they've been sensitively designed uh, or perhaps not. Give us a vision of what that looks like, almost taking the laneway suite policy and starting to apply it to a garden suite context. So I think that one of the one of the, the things that we did with, with the laneway housing policy is that we developed kind of a maximum building footprint, sort of a building envelope. Um, and that really addressed lots of the sensitivities that we heard from, from the various people that we spoke to. Issues like privacy and overlook, issues like shadowing, um, these were really, really significant issues for people in neighborhoods. Um, 
And then there were things like, how do you access it? Um, and things of where do the windows go? Are you allowed balconies? Those kinds of things. So I think with, um, with garden suites, we're, we're going to have to look at those things again. I think the, a lot of the same issues um, will come to the forefront. The one big difference I would say is that garden suite policy is going to be enacted in kind of a larger number of neighborhoods than laneway suites, simply because the laneway network is is really within the former city of Toronto and it kind of pokes out to a couple of the other, um, the other former cities. Um, but single family detached neighborhoods exist everywhere. Um, and so the impact of garden suites will be kind of much more significant and they'll potentially address neighborhoods where people are kind of more conservative, more conservative in terms of what they see happening in their neighborhoods. Um, but yeah, like, well, I think, you know, I think the same sort of approach that we took with Laneway Suites, where we get out there and let people contribute, let people voice their opinions about what's important to them. I think that approach um, will yield some, some good, good solid policy in the end. Yeah, you touched on a lot of good things there. I mean, the, the first thing I think of listening to that it was the pilot area that the city implemented for laneway suites before they rolled it into the broader mm -hmm. city i wonder if this policy starts to become more geographically specific rather than something that's universal simply because you don't have that public realm of the laneway to rely on like mm -hmm. you're facing a lot more neighbors that you have a lot more impact on in these cases yeah i mean it could be it could be based on on um something like lot size okay. i I know that there are, um, yeah, there's lots of different neighborhood contexts that, that will have to be addressed. Um, but I do think like even, I think generally, um, a lot of the issues that people will have with regards to detached secondary suites um, on properties within neighborhoods will be similar. I mean, you know, it's basic things like privacy, um, overlook shadowing, um, trees will be an issue, those kinds of things, access, um, the biggest question in my eye, my mind is, will they be two stories like a laneway house? I doubt they will be, but it would be interesting to see if any neighborhoods would be amenable to mm -hmm. something a little taller in their backyards. I mean, the reason I don't think there would be is exactly like you say, privacy, shadowing, overlook, like those are pretty major concerns that when you're looking at a laneway, it's not a problem. But when you're looking into someone's backyard, it kind of is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I know that you and I have spoken a little bit about, um, you know, kind of what we what we see as the issues related to garden suites. And, and um, we kind of landed on, on the fact that a one story garden suite would probably be the most appropriate for most neighborhoods. And um, there are situations like if you think about um, corner lots with um, detached garages on the flanking street. I mean, I with, without laneways, I could see that as a situation where a two story um, garden suite could potentially work well. Um, but you know, when you're dealing with backyards in um, suburban single family detached neighborhoods, I think one story may be the better way to approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the benefit is you don't need to contemplate parking in a garden suite. So a lot more of the square footage is available for living space and you don't necessarily need that second floor. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And I think, that, I think that one of the things that we should also, we should also speak to is the fact that um, Garden suites could potentially be easier and more economical to construct because you're not dealing with um, site conditions that are as constrained, um, and there may be a little bit more flexibility in terms of in terms of how you build them. So I think that 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 as we move down the road toward creating policy is something that that would be very very interesting to to look into. And we know that um, there are situations in, in other cities in North America that have approved garden suite policy in place. There's lots of interesting um, kind of modular construction that, that um, different different companies in different cities are looking at, um, and so I think that I think that it provides a, a really really interesting um, housing type that could could make good use of that kind of thing. Yeah, one of the comments in the chat just brought up what was going to be my next point is uh, Ottawa already has an as of right garden suite policy in place, and they allow two stories, but um, Certainly their law context is a lot different than Toronto. That was something we learned from in adapting the, or learning from the Vancouver laneway housing policy. You can't just blanket apply that to Toronto because our law conditions are so different. Um, our context just can't support the same form. That's gonna be the same. So although there's a precedent in Ottawa for an as of right garden suite policy is maybe not directly applicable, is it? 
No, I don't think so. I think that we all we have to look at our kind of urban contexts on their own. Um, we could take some of the best practices um, from cities like Ottawa, um, but we do. We have, we have to adapt them. I think that that's that's pretty clear. Yeah. By the same token, there are two-story coach houses in Toronto. So what do we do? Tell us, Andrew. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> we have to bring the question out there and ask the people. Well, I mean, in my mind, um, before and as of right, laneway policy existed. People were building laneway houses and they were massive. They were like three story infill houses. And you kind of had to do that to justify the expense and the yeah. time consumption of the old Absolutely. antiquated po process. As soon as an as of right process is in place, you can reduce the allowable density quite a bit and still make it attractive to people who live in these neighborhoods. Oh, for sure. I mean, I remember that you and I spoke to um, a homeowner in the annex this probably a few years ago now who um, built a garden suite effectively and just the fees alone that he had to pay um, development charges and parks levies amounted to uh, over $100,000 for, for kind of like a a fairly kind of fairly small garden suite and so yeah you're right I mean if you're going to take on that challenge you got to make sure it's worthwhile in the end. It's an interesting point about development charges and that's something that's blown my mind with the laneway suite policy. Uh, like Alex was saying developers aren't really biting into laneway suites nearly as much as individual homeowners uh, and I didn't think that would be the case because you don't have to pay development charges for a laneway suite. I was a little concerned that would open the door to just greedy people to come in and build these. But that just hasn't been the case because of the scale of this type of housing. Mm -hmm. The fact that the development charges aren't there means it's attractive to homeowners, but the scale means it's still not attractive to people who don't have a vested interest in where they're being built. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. And I think that's one of the points we were making all along is that um, when laneway housing policy was, was implemented, we didn't expect to see kind of this flood of laneway houses, neighborhoods transformed overnight with, with kind of rows and rows of laneway suites um, being built. It's kind of a slow iterative process that allows us to kind of almost like test whether or not the policy is working, test whether or not there are things that have to be tweaked as we move forward. And so I think the same sort of idea um, can be applied to garden suites. It will be, you know, policy will be created They'll be constructed, but it'll be a kind of a slow, iterative process that'll allow us to to adapt it if we um, think that mm. we need to. Well, I think something we've learned is that although the laneway suite policy has taught us a lot about what a garden suite policy could look like, it's not going to be as simple as just rewriting the script. No. The things that really worked for the laneway suite policy were the process of engaging our fellow Torontonians um and the accessibility to homeowners and those are things that won't necessarily determine the form of a garden suite but they will determine how we get to a policy for them exactly exactly hmm. we, had a, we had a really effective process and i think that it's you know we should we should build on that when we uh, look to garden suites absolutely well uh, i think a lot of the people on this live stream are hopefully going to help us with that and uh, i'm pretty optimistic we can all come together to do this again work pretty well for laneway housing on to the next frontier yep good well thanks everyone for joining us today uh, this is the first of what we hope will be many uh, lunchtime discussions tune in next week uh, when i'll be chatting with tony kuna we have subsequent weeks with uh, journalists and sustainable builders to cover all kinds of things related to laneway housing uh, so thanks very much everyone uh, we hope to see you at future lanescape live streams and hopefully publicly engaged in a garden suite policy soon thanks everybody thanks everyone